don't worry about it. I'd like to bring this meeting of the school committee to order and ask you to join with me in a pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. As you, as uh, our viewers can tell, we started this committee early, the meeting early tonight because we have to go into executive session for the purposes of discussing a matter relative to, to student safety. And so at this point, to go into executive session, I would need a motion. Ms. Hunt. I move that we go into executive session to discuss student safety. Is there a second? I have a second by M Michelle Badger. Are there any questions to the motion? Okay, uh, this has to be a roll call vote, starting at the end. Yes, Ms. Ms. Badger, yes. Yes. Ms. Morgan, yes. Ms. Hunt. Yes. Chair votes, yes. Yes. The school committee will go into executive session to discuss student safety. At the end of executive session, we will come back out here in open session and continue our evening business. Chief Boteri will be joining us in executive session. Apologize for a few minutes of being late. We are in an executive session. So we are now, uh, we already started our meeting with the pledge and then we went to executive session and now we're uh, at a really nice uh, uh, agenda item here, wel welcoming our international students and the faculty, Dr. Maestas. Yes, we have um, had the very distinct uh, honor of having some students come from Milan, Italy and I have uh, Rob Powers at the table. He's our social studies coordinator. And uh, Allison Reardon at the back, and she doesn't want to be on camera tonight, probably. Uh, but we'll zoom in on her anyway. But um, just want uh, to give you a brief introduction, then Rob can talk about it a little bit. We had the opportunity to connect with um, a colleague of mine in, in Italy um, probably a year and a half ago and talked about the possibility of doing this exchange and to see that here we are um, a year and a half later and students from Milan are here and students from Plymouth will be going to Milan mm. and creating this partnership where students can come and stay with families and go to school and experience what it's like to be in another country and another school system and really identify the benefits of being in school for a week or more. So Rob and Allison uh, have been um, lassoed into uh, being part of the organization of helping us get, get this together. And Rob is uh, gracious enough to come and talk a little bit about the program and kind of give you an overview. So Rob. Sure, so good evening. Uh, it's exciting to be here to uh, introduce our guests from uh, Colegio San Carlo in Milan. This is part of a program that you approved earlier uh, in the spring, uh, which is a one-to-one -one model exchange program between our students and the students at Colegio San Carlo, which is a uh, school that is K-12 in the center of Milan. Um, and the students that are visiting us uh, <coughs> for this part of the program are actually all uh, in the STEM wing of the school so uh, just as much as this program is about cultural experiences and uh, the history of the area as well it's also an opportunity thanks to um, Allison Reardon for the students to take in the STEM experience both within the district and, and the opportunities that exist in the, the Boston area as well um, so we have 12 students from their high school level uh, STEM program uh, and they are guided here by their two teachers Margarita Sessa and Francesca Peregrino uh, who are here. Um, most of the students are here tonight with their corresponding student and family. They arrived uh, on Saturday afternoon, so it's been a whirlwind, whirlwind start. They had one day with the family. I already know that there were a lot of fall activities going on and uh, acclimating to the area yesterday. And then today, um, they spent the day shadowing their corresponding student and attending all the classes with them as well. Um, Allison also brought uh, one of their faculty leaders to a science conference today and she'll be bringing the other uh, faculty leader to a science conference on Friday. So they get a little professional development while they're here as well. Um, and we have a very ambitious uh, agenda for them while they're here. Uh, some of the days they'll be shadowing the students that they're staying with uh, in school, and then other days they'll be 
uh, leaving them to participate in different cultural activities or STEM activities. For example, tomorrow, uh, we will be taking the students and their teachers to Boston for the day. We'll do a guided tour of the Freedom Trail in the morning, and then after lunch at Quincy Market, we've arranged for a campus tour of MIT. Uh, and then we'll do a tour of the plantation in Pilgrim Hall and a walking tour of downtown Plymouth on Wednesday. They'll spend a few more days uh, at the schools with their uh, corresponding students. They'll spend the weekends, uh, the weekend with their families. And then for two days next week, uh, they will be participating in a variety of STEM activities uh, at Plymouth South Middle School and also at the high school. So a really packed agenda. We have some evening activities as well. We will have a, a potluck with all the families uh, closer to their departure. They'll be uh, dropping in on a Northern Lights rehearsal and uh, attending a planetarium show. So not, uh, not bored, I think, is what this experience will be, hopefully. But um, what really excites me about it as well is that this is part of this new global learning initiative that I came to present about in May. Uh, this idea that our students will not only be hosting and, and building this relationship here uh, this month, but then traveling to Milan in February during February vacation and taking in uh, art and history and culture in that area and continuing this relationship with the same family, which is really exciting and, and truly the type of um, global citizen that we're looking to build here in Plymouth. So, Well, with that itinerary, we're, we're, we're actually honored that you were able to make it here tonight. Mm. So please introduce the crew to us. Sure. Uh, does every, do, do, do they want to come up? Like, yeah. Everybody. Yes. How about we do this? How about host students will bring their students up and introduce? Oh, hey, hey, there you go. There you go. Oh, you thought you were going to get out of it. Of this. <laughs> Do you want to hand the mic, Rob? Rob, yeah, you can take the, the mic off oh, and just have them stand up and do it. If they can't pronounce the names, they say they can say. Okay, I feel like a talk show host. Who would like to go first? All right. Oh, here we go. Your name and then the name of the student that you are hosting. Alexander Godfrey, and this is Gaia Tognato. Nice, nice. All right, who's next? Headed back here. All right. Hi, I'm Garen Anderson, and my uh, exchange student is Julia. Okay. They stand up. We don't see. I'm um, Steven Chiruna, and my exchange student is Alessandra. Right. And feel free to wave if you're from Italy. <laughs> Great. Um, over here. Um, I'm Abigail King, and my student's name is Sofia Bueno. Bueno. <laughs> My name is Lainey Powers, and my student is Nietzsche Papalatera. Great. <laughs> Did we get everybody? Cool. So uh, we have a few other families that couldn't join us this evening, but um, that's, that's our crew, and we're really excited to, uh, to learn alongside them for the next week and a half. That's great. Any, any comments from uh, Ms. Ms. Hunt? Of course. I, I have to make a comment it's to everybody. So this summer... I <clears throat> took my daughter and spent two weeks in Spain with a girl that lived with me for a year when I was your age, 35 years ago. I've been there three times. She's been here. So take advantage of every opportunity that you're, you're getting right now. Stay in touch. It's going to change your life. You're going to think about it every day. And it just makes you a better citizen. And just enjoy it because it's definitely life changing so enjoy it. like I said I got to take my daughter back after 33 years or 35 years so it was pretty it's pretty cool so you're making friends that you're gonna have for the rest of your lives it's amazing thank you for doing it okay thank you so much for coming here this evening thank you get some rest yeah. yes mm -hmm. tired. It's so fun. they look tired I know I saw I saw a couple of them today when the North so Library yeah. after our yeah. classroom. Yeah. 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 What? what? It's it's missing. Right. <laughs> they got that down. Jet lag. Yeah, jet lag was. <laughs> yeah. they didn't even, I don't think they even walked into the school. Yes, yeah. 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 The Dominican they get to do this. Oh, they yeah. do. Yeah. They, they are. They it looks like, look like it's off. These ones are good. These ones are good when they actually get to Have you been in all four years? Nothing. I just like typing with nothing on the screen. 
Yeah, that's probably, I can see what you're doing over there. Absolutely nothing. I was unopposed. Thank you. Thank you. I, I can uh, skip the next agenda item. Well, that's true. <laughs> what is it? Oh, <laughs> there's nobody here. No, well, there's, there's two people sitting yeah, here. They're, they're here for the... Uh, <laughs> they might have something else. <laughs> okay, uh, let's do our student representatives. Student representatives, can we start with North? Oh, start with North. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Jack Freeman. I am the senior class president for the class of 2020. And just give me a moment, because if you told me in the first grade, which was, I don't know, like over a decade ago, that I was going to be sitting across from the dream ride guy, <laughs> I'm on a bike, I would have called you crazy. I would have laughed in your face. I'm gonna love it. You would have had a little six-year-old at your knees you. laughing at you. Wow. Um, the truth is, Jack, you are, so keep going. <laughs> Take it all in. <laughs> so this is my first time at one of these. Um, this is the first time, actually, I've had to wear a suit as the president of my class, which... I won't lie, feels awesome. Oh, feels wonderful. Great. <laughs> wonderful. I'm jealous that you guys get to wear suits every day of your lives. Oh, yeah, I get to. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so since it's your first day, we'll now listen to South so you can understand what usually happens. All right. Okay. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, student athletes, coaches, faculty, and parents raised over $600 to fight against breast cancer at the field hockey game th last week. PSHS will be doing our annual Pink Day next Friday, and we will definitely be, be making a sizable donation for the cause. Our guests from Milan um, have arrived. PSHS students and, staffs, and staff are hosting one teacher on four students from Milan, from Milan. We are so excited to build a global learning relationship with Italy. Thank you to Science Coordinator Allison Reardon and Social Studies Coordinator Rob Powers for organizing the itinerary for the week along with PSHS lead teachers, Mrs. Sorensen and Mr. Schuller, who will both be traveling with our students to, Mul to Milan in February. Students from France will be visiting us um, next week. Host families from both North and South High School um, will welcome our guests on October 27th and we'll have a true one-to-one -one exchange as our hosting students will travel back to France in the spring. Um, special thanks to Ms. Beach and Mrs. Lewison for organizing this exchange. The biomedical program will honor the junior cohort with the annual white coat celebration on Thursday in the Black Box Theater. Students re will receive their lab coats in recognition for what they have achieved thus far in the program. STEM week is here. Congratulations to Project Lead the Way teacher, Dr. Jessica Mead, as she was selected as the 2019 Massachusetts PLCW Standout Teacher Award. Dr. Mead goes above and beyond every day for her students. It's well-deserved. PSHS graduate um, Sarah Francis presented at the PLTW conference today on the student panel at WPI. Um, Sarah is studying biomedical engineering biomedical engineering. Parents have been invited to our first of many parent forums this Friday at 7.30 a.m. in culinary. The topic is vaping and school initiatives centered around this issue affecting our teens. Mr. Hanna and Mr. Ranger, along with the health teachers and PYDC friends, will lead the discussion and answer questions. Life Touch will be back Thursday for picture makeups during all lunches. Did you visit Trunk or Treat? Halloween festival this past Saturday? Hmm. Well, if not, you missed an amazing event hosted by Skills USA and the National Honor Society. The feedback has been amazing. Great job to all and can, cannot wait till next year. Congratulations to our new Patriot League champs. The football team clinched the title with a win over North Quincy last Friday and will host a playoff game on November 1st. Currently, the team is ranked number two in the South section. Congratulations to the coaches and players for all their hard work and dedication. The Plymouth South Unified Basketball Team took on the Eagles today at home. What a great showing by our students, cheer, and dance teams. We packed the house to show support. Congratulations to both teams on a great game. Breaking news. The boys cross country team are um, their league champions for the first time since the two schools have been combined. Um, led by Captain Strickland Davis and Nathan LaPointe, they put a hammer down on their arch rivals Hanover today. We are so proud of the team and the coaches. Finally, um, my perspective. So I just started doing unified basketball this year, and I think it's a really awesome opportunity like that both schools have because it's a great way to like bring the community community together. It's just a good atmosphere. So Fantastic. Nice. Thank you. Okay, Jack. Now back to you. 
All right, awesome. Great job. Um, <laughs> you've been here before. <laughs> so first of all, as you all know, um, NIASC is visiting our school. They visited us for the first day today. I know they were here yesterday. Um, it's comprised of 16 educators from across New England. They're visiting North to evaluate, to evaluate our performance in seven standards for the renewal for another 10 years of accreditation. Um, I've met a lot of them. They're great people. They're friendly. You would barely even notice them um, if you didn't reach out to talk to them. Um, I was in the conference room with two of them today, two teachers from New Bedford, New Bedford, sorry, a special education teacher and a history teacher. Um, it was a very pleasant experience. It wasn't at all as nerve-wracking as I thought it would be. They asked me questions about our school. I answered honestly. We have a great school. We have a great group of teachers, and I really enjoyed having them there. Um, Life Touch picture retakes will take place Friday, November 8th, for any of you who want to get your pictures retaken by Life Touch. Um, PNHS Athletics. Plymouth North High School is excited to announce that four of our athletic teams are moving on to the MIAA state tournaments. Congratulations to the girls volleyball team, boys soccer team, boys golf team, and field hockey team. Um, we're wishing all of our athletic students luck during these tournaments. I know golf had their first match today. I'm obviously waiting to hear about that. I have a lot of friends on the golf team whom I care for very much. Um, PSATs, um, a huge thanks to the guidance office, the most underrated office at Plymouth North. Um, they're always there for any student that needs them. They were incredibly integral in preparing our students for PSATs. I know they just helped me send in my transcript and my SAT scores. So they're great down there. They did a fantastic job. Um, and as we just saw them come and then swiftly leave. The Milan Exchange students are at North. Um, we're hosting eight STEM students from Milan. Students arrived on Saturday, October 19th, and will stay with host families until the 30th. While here, the students will visit many of the Plymouth historical sites along with the Boston Freedom Trail and tour MIT. During the school day, they will shadow their student and experience special science classes and visit the Blake Planetarium as well, as um, oh, Mr. Powers, Mr. Powers yeah. as he said. Um, hometowns Handmade Fall Fair. This is something, um, personally, I'm in student council, so I've been involved in helping plan it um, for four years. It's very nice. I've always enjoyed the craft fair. Um, if the spring craft fair was any indication for how many vendors, visitors, and events there will be at student council's fall craft fair next Saturday, you will be very impressed. They wrote it in all caps. Um, it's next Saturday takes place from 10 a.m. to 2.30 p.m., and Student Council will host 105 vendor booths, face painting, live music, and much more. Be sure to stop by. The fall drama production will be The Servant of Two Masters on Friday, November 8th at 7 p.m., and Saturday, November 9th at 7 p.m. Both performances will be held at the Plymouth North High School Performing Arts Center. End of the first quarter. Marks closed. On Friday, November 1st, well, they close. It says closed here. I'm sorry. And report cards will be distributed on Friday, November 8th. All parents and guardians should expect their student to return home from school with their report card. Homecoming. Homecoming weekend was a major success with over 700 tickets sold for this event. Thank you to Kim Walcott and Elise Glenn. Um, they're not on here, but I just wanted to thank um, Alex Antonino, Josh Brown, and Jeff Yang. And I won't thank myself, but we all... <laughs> really came together this year and planned homecoming and pushed people to go. And it was a lot of fun. We sold a lot of tickets, but obviously we couldn't have done it without Mrs. Walcott and Miss Glenn. They're great. Um, and we also this year tried a, kind of a tailgate before the football game, the homecoming football game. We brought out games, face painting, free raffles. We did a pumpkin decorating contest. Um, students seemed to love it. And it was a great success because we've had difficulty getting student participation throughout the years. And don't worry, I'm almost done. Um, finally, Mr. Parsons' parent page. Principal Peter Parsons, say that three times fast, most current page is posted. This is a great way to stay informed on all things Plymouth North.
Thank you, guys. That was Thank a great you. report for your Thank first you. report. <laughs> Thank you. Now you really set the bar high. Yes. <laughs> yes. All right. Thanks a lot for, to both of you. Thank you. Okay, we have a uh, uh, updated uh, council plan, Dr. Mayas. Yes, tonight we have the uh, update to Plymouth South Elementary School School Improvement Plan, and we have Principal Adam Blaisdell is here tonight to um, provide this update. So we want to welcome you, Adam, and you can do introductions or introduction. <laughs> um, good evening, everyone. I want to thank John Duffy. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thank you. Um, last year, we presented um, the beginning of our three-year school improvement plan, um, which had four goals on it. The first two really focused on increasing MCAS um, performance in both ELA and math. Um, the third goal looked at social-emotional learning and really looking at utilizing leader and me in second step um, and really looking at decreasing behavior referrals. And our fourth goal was really looking at family connections and um, really create more curriculum focused opportunities um, for fa our families to engage in. Um, I'm just going to highlight a couple things from our first goals and then I'm going to talk a little bit about our action steps for um, the upcoming year. <coughs> so the first thing I want, wanted to highlight is um, one of the things that we talked a little bit about was really social emotional learning. Um, and years ago, we had started a PBIS, a positive behavioral intervention system um, approach, and we revised it quite a bit this year. And so, um, right at the very beginning of the year, we introduced Cub Coins to our to our students. Um, we really talked to Federal Furnace and really kind of modeled a lot of what they were doing over there, um, and really brought it to South. Um, so students are basically reinforced for any positive behaviors that we see. And if we're, any staff member is involved, then kids just receive a simple coin. And they bring that back to their, for any, like I said, positive behavior. And the staff, one of the things they have to do is be very, very specific about what the behavior is that they saw um, so the students know what, what was reinforced and what to repeat. Um, and then when they go back to their classroom, there is a little fishbowl. Fishbowl means nothing. It's just a collection device. But there's a fishbowl, and the goal is just for the class to fit, fill up their fishbowl. Um, and then at the end of that, they receive some sort of class incentive. And the class incentive can be very simple. Um, they wear silly socks one day, silly hairdo one day, um, reading for a period of time. So it's a very simple, um, can be very simple. Um, then the next piece would be that, then once they fill that, they bring it and they fill up basically a larger grade level type of bowl. Um, and once they fill up that, the grade level receives some sort of incentive. And again, the incentives can be very, very simple and don't, don't take much time. And then when the grade level fills up their bowl, they fill it into a large tank, and then the, the, the goal is, is that the, the school were to fill up their tank. And then there's some sort of incentive for the school that all the kids vote on, whatever that incentive is. So we're really not having any um, influence on what that might be except for kind of keeping it simple. Um, so when you walk in, our, if you were to walk in our front lobby, you would see um, these fish bowls. There's a picture of it in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, you'd see these fish bowls, and then the grade level ones, and then the larger fish bowl. Um, and there's a few pictures of some of our kids just bringing their classroom fish bowls to um, the grade level fish bowl. So um, this was something that we revamped this year, um, and the kids have really bought into it. They love it, I'm sure. Kids, I know kids are going home and talking about coins that they've earned. And again, it's a simple coin for any positive behavior that they're, that they're, district, that they're showing. Um, so this really targets really um, our goal in regards to increasing the, the positivity and, and behaviors and decreasing referrals in our, in our school. Um, the other one that I want to highlight is, um, again, really looking at that social emotional but keeping kids on track is we had created this past summer, and I think you probably have seen some of these mm -hmm. on the news, mm -hmm. um, sensory hallways um, for kids. And the teachers spent quite a bit of time at the beginning of the school year teaching the kids how to use these and what they're, how to follow it and so forth. Um, and so teachers will bring their class there. Sometimes teachers will 
have kids just a few kids here and there go down and use use it to get back on track and then come back um, and even to tell you the truth when the kids are walking down the hallway they're just using it um, on their way to class or the bathroom or wherever they're going um, but so teachers were explicitly teaching kids to to do that um, to help with recess to give kids other things to do at recess our PTA spent quite a bit of time this summer it was supposed to be last April but because of the the weather that we had last April, they spent quite a bit of time this summer um, giving kids something else to do. So repainting Foursquare, Hopscotch, there's quite a, they painted a track inside of our tennis court. Um, so they spent quite a bit of time really just, again, trying to give kids something to do at recess, um, a little bit more structured than just replay. So those were just a couple of the highlights that I wanted to, to talk about from some of the things that we've been doing this past year. Um, and then when you look at, at the status of our action plan, all the pieces that are in red are things that were done this past year as well. Um, but just want to focus on, we have five action steps that we're really going to focus on this school year. Um, and it's really based upon, MC the re reason we picked these were really based upon MCAS data, um, benchmark reading scores that we had given to students in the spring and in the fall, um, discipline, attendance, um, and some prior survey results that we had talked done a little while ago. Um, so the first action step that we're really focusing on is really looking at um, getting students to participate in a lot more problem solving activities as we throughout the week. Um, and that's really from looking at our MCAS data, looking at how students are performing, that's really one of the places where we, where we fall um, is really that application based, how can we get kids to solve problems of, of tasks that they know how to do but just they're not applying. Um, if you look at our MCAS scores, you'll notice that our grade three MCAS scores went up quite a bit, um, and our grade five and our grade four had gone down. Um, what we had noticed in grade three is we had been implement we implemented um, math workshop last year, um, and our grade three teachers spent a lot of time with doing PD um, with our math coaches and an outside consultant. So we're really seeing the that pay off. And if you were to walk into the classroom, you'd see the students a lot more engaged in different activities and, um, and what they're doing. And the teachers are really working on trying to implement a lot more problem solving in their classrooms. Um, we have a couple other grade levels. We have grade two that kind of implemented it on their own um, with some oversight from some of our math, from our math coach. Um, and grade four has started it last year again with some oversight from our math coach, but really are they're engaging in some <coughs> math PD this year as well. So. Um, we're hopeful that those those few steps will really help with some of our other um, in, increasing our MCAS scores there. <coughs> but we're, we're really also making it a point and making sure that problem solving activities are incorporated into classrooms throughout the week multiple times. Um, um, and we're also looking at the other piece that, that's, that we're really focusing on is we've I've scheduled all of our staff <coughs> meetings really to be focused on looking at student work throughout the year. <coughs> um, so teachers will be coming with actual student work um, and we'll be analyzing those at all of our staff meetings. And that's rotated through reading, writing, and math. Um, and we're using a district created rubric um, that I'm th to kind of look at the math portion of, of those. Um, and like I said, we're really working with our literacy coaches and math coaches to plan those staff meetings and what are we looking at um, and making sure that it's, it's associated with whatever current units that we're working on. Um, so teachers have to bring current work. It can't be a month or two old. It has to be something that the kids are doing now. Um, our second action step looks at that designated meeting time that I just spoke about just a moment ago. Um, and that's really, like I said, we presented at the beginning of the year a calendar for all of our staff meetings. And it, and it rotates through the year and our math coach and our literacy coaches have been joining us at those, at those meetings as well. Um, and our third action step is looking at attendance. Um, if you look at our absenteeism, um, our, absent, our chronic absenteeism increased from 4.8% in 2018 to 6.6% in 2019. Um, and last year we did spend some more time looking at attendance and sending attendance letters home and making phone calls and following up, um, but we did still see that, that increase. Um, so we're kind of stepping it up. We're going to continue to do 
um, attendance letters that we have. We're going to be working with our um, attendance officer a little bit more, um, but we're really going to fall back and really trying to do some in school as well, where we're tracking attendance and classrooms with 96% attendance or greater get, get a, a paw that they can post outside their door. Um, and whatever the class that had the best attendance that week will get a gold paw. And it's just something they can post. And we started it a couple of years ago. We didn't do it last year. And it, we, we did see kids really kind of buy into it. So it's just a visual reminder of how is our class, how are we doing with attendance? And um, it really helped. Our fourth one is looking at um, second step. It's really where we have been working with the leader and me for a couple of years is, is really implementing second step on a consistent basis. Um, at the beginning of the year, I provided teachers a, a pacing chart basically that said, this week, teach this lesson. This, so we really laid it out um, when they should be teaching certain lessons. Um, and this also looks at the, the whole PBIS system that we recreated and re restructured, so that is also um, involved as well. Um, other things, when it talks about strategy tools in this action step, um, a lot of the classrooms have implemented calm down corners where kids can use calming strategies that they've taught them. Um, once a week we get, we have a morning meeting where the whole school comes in to the gym on Wednesday mornings and having 630 students in one room um, can, ha can cause, have some effects on some students, so we have that available for kids in the gym as well um, during that. Um, and like I said, we talked about the sensor. <coughs> and our final um, action step is um, having each grade level conduct a student par parent teaching of concepts of curriculum. Um, our grade three, the pet last year, had invited parents, so grandparents to come in, or aunts or uncles, or whoever really wanted to come in. And they did something, I think they called it muffins muffins for math, or math with muffins, or something like that. Really, it was the kids were sitting down with the, the parents or whoever came and, and taught them a game or taught them a skill. Um, and it really was well received. And it's one of those things that we've been hearing quite a bit about is, I don't know how to do this as a parent. So if we can expand, we're looking to expand that to other grade levels as well. Um, so those are our five action steps. Um, I wanted to touch base on absenteeism. Is there? a way uh, like school-wide um, that you guys could post s either an email or something to remind everybody the rules of absenteeism and that it actually you can actually be fined hmm. if you have continuous absenteeism it's mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody really realizes the repercussions I think that's a great idea. I think one of the uh, difficult points with absenteeism is parents don't realize it until it's too late. And I think if, and that's maybe something that principals can do during open house, talk to parents about, even in the newsletter, about how you know, it's the, the Massachusetts general law indicates that 10% of the school year is deemed a chronic absenteeism. If you miss 10% and it's unexcused, you should fail. That means you'll get retained automatically. Right. I think we deal with a lot more in high school than we do with elementary. But when you start seeing 6%, 6 percent, 6.6 percent of the students of a school that have chronic absenteeism at, uh, at uh, South Elementary, that's probably 50 students. It's a staggering number. And for us, that's concerning because we find that those trends continue. Mm -hmm. So it gets worse as the years go on. So I think your point is well taken, and I think that's one thing we can strategize is just so that people know that it's not the school trying to be, you know, on you. Right. It's, it's the state law says your, st your child needs to be in the seat right. for us to educate them. Because it has gone in newsletters and it has gone um, yeah. home and it has been spoken about. But if we take it up to the next level and have it come from the next level, yeah. then it might be received a little better. <clears throat> I like the suggestion. Uh, on, the, on the topic of absenteeism, uh, 
I think there's a great, there's a very important educational piece that has to go to the parents, mm -hmm. not to the students, because when you start in second and third grade to tell the child, well, it's your birthday, you can take off from school, mm -hmm. or we're going on vacation to Disney World, so you're going to miss the week. Yes. Once you create, what you're creating with that is school isn't that important that there are other things that are more important than school. And once you plant that seed, it takes root. And then when they get to the high school, the littlest thing, they stay off, they stay home. Because they've already, they've already learned early on that school's not that important. So I, I think part of this is educating the parents that you don't take off because it's your birthday. Right. You know, and other no, things. That's, no, it has to go to the parents. The parents are the ones that are actually allowing them to stay home. So, especially now. And I think when we had, when we did the pause a couple of years, even though we were sending out the letters, but even though we were sending up the pause out, it isn't, it is a, it isn't a second graders. But it, it, when the, when the child goes home and says, oh, we got a paw because we had 96% in our, like they, they made it important and then the parent kind of shifted hmm. some, some thinking. And so it really wasn't the second grader, it was the second <coughs> grader going home and saying, look what happened because we had great attendance. So. Um, but you're right, it's... Ms. Hayward. Um, I, I'm going to um, agree with um, Jim. It, it could possibly be um, a strategy that can be incorporated in the family engagement piece because, um, <clears throat> honestly, I think of my first grader, uh, to elicit information from him <laughs> is a, um, a, a <laughs> difficult at best, you know, <laughs> hey, it was oh, fine, you know, so um, you don't hear those, you know, pieces of information. So it's to get the buy-in from the parents um, as to the importance of, of um, what uh, being in school is and what absenteeism um, does to their students. So maybe just incorporating that into that, um, the family engagement piece. Because um, I can honestly say, um, if it's something that's received in an email, you're so inundated with like emails and pieces of paper, unless it's something that the child needs to uh, bring back, if it's homework or something like this one, then that's something that will catch my eye, as opposed to an email. So it's um, sometimes it is that you know one-on-one -on -one piece um, and uh, or information that's given that perhaps the parents say you know what um, this is truly important. Um, so I don't know. That's just okay. Let me uh, now. I'm going to dovetail that at the National School Board conference. I attended a a conference on letters going home to parents and what's the value of them, and the conclusion was that if you get a card in the mail. It's just a card. You're likely to turn it over and read the other side. If you open up a letter from the school, you probably don't read it. Yeah. So if you want to send a message out, put it on a card and make it, and make it four sentences. The chances are it's going to get read. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Colorful. OK. Go on. You have the floor. Are you, are you finished? We're finished. If you have questions, any other questions. More questions. Um, Ms. Badger. I don't have any questions, but I was really, I really loved hearing that you mentioned that in the beginning of the presentation and you said, we took this from Federal Furnace. I know we're always saying like, oh, that's a great idea. Have you talked to another school? It was wonderful to hear that because I think when we find best practices and things that work, we need to do a better job as a district of applying it everywhere else. So thank you for working with your peers and using the tools that were already there and not having to recreate a wheel because who needs to do it when you find something that already works so thank you for that and i have to say the absenteeism thing when i was um, reading your goals initially at the top where you had the red and things you were going to do i thought oh these kids are gonna uh, where it said they're gonna that some certain grades are going to track their own attendance and i was thinking the onus that's wonderful you're putting it on the child and obviously the parent still has some involvement because they're young but i thought Hmm, maybe that'll increase the attendance, the likelihood of attendance. And I'm sure you thought the same thing. And I was really surprised to see that it went up instead of down. And but you know, mm. but that was just a surprising thing for me. Um, but I really liked how you really have taken a lot of thought into the steps you're going to take to reach your goal. You've looked at the places you've tried things and what has worked and what hasn't worked, and you're taking what's worked and really kind of building on that. So. Thanks for a great presentation. Mm -hmm. I have a specific question. Would you bring the slide up on the MCAS scores? Uh, specifically, oh, well, I have it written down here. Uh, maybe you can speak to it. The, when the, uh, this is the MCAS 2018 fourth grade math scores, 
<coughs> and then when those uh, fourth graders were fifth graders in 2019, it was 33 percent. That's the biggest change in percentage points of anything else on this chart. So it really jumped out at me. Mm -hmm. So what happened to those fourth graders? We test. <coughs> we're, uh, we're still looking at that, to be honest with you. I mean, one of the things that we saw was our constructor responses were not. We, we really fell down on those. Um, there were a couple other areas where we, where we had fallen as well. But I mean, one of the, the glaring pieces was constructed response. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing that we've noticed, not just here, but with our ELA piece too, when you look at what a student does, and this is something again we're, we're looking at too, when you're looking at what a student produces in writing, in their writing journals or in their notebooks, um, some of the students can really, really show us, and this goes for math as well and how they're responding in math, some of them can do a really good job um, and can write a write a story and, and do and give us a lot of thought and detail and when you ask them to do a constructive response in math they can do a decent job you throw them on the computer and yeah. you compare this and this and it's like what happened mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so that's one of the things that we are i've told i've had a conversation with the staff this year and said they don't always need to be writing in their writing journal whatever we thought have happened before you can i want you to take some in the writing journal by hand but they need to be using computers mm -hmm. constantly because mm -hmm. what they're creating on paper by hand isn't what. Interesting. Being Very made. interesting. I think you had. A, I think you have a really good point there. Yeah, I Ms. saw Hunt. that with Joey. Um, also, I don't know if you noticed that from my job, I've been doing a lot of research on this year's or last year's MCAS, and one of the things that I learned is, especially under grade seven, that. All the grades across the board for the state are lower because mm -hmm. it was the first time they got the next gen test. And a lot of schools, not, not, not necessarily ours, a lot of schools is the first time they use the computer. Mm -hmm. So when you just said when they get on the computer, it's different. So I, I don't know if you've found, I know, I know and, it's, and it seems to be in writing that, that I had the problems too with my job. So I don't know if there's something with that, that test and that part of it, but it seems like that's the that's the same issue I'm having. We've been doing computer for <coughs> years. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. it's the next te the the new test across the board. They're having lower right. and it's, but scores. It's the first time we've really looked at mm. like what are they creating right on their own. And yeah. What doing here. So yeah. That's the first time we started looking at it. Dr. Campbell. Yeah, as Dr. Blaisdell <coughs> said, it's a difference between using the computers and then using it for testing purposes yeah. and getting them to understand that, you know, this handwritten writing sample, you know, if it's going to be of, of um, quality and adequate, you need to think about how that translates to, to the technology. Mm. So giving students opportunities to engage in those. We don't want to get it. We talked about this earlier. Yeah. We don't want to get away <coughs> from having students writing, but they need to have opportunities to engage in the technology that the test is in. Um, for everyone to prepare mm -hmm. them for that so it's you know it's it's looking at standards and looking at making sure that they're um, practicing those standards early and often but also applying those into the integration of the, the Chromebooks and the technology mm -hmm. that they'll be using for testing purposes so it's it's a whole different genre that we're getting them ready for really in that regard so and the um, evaluation levels are different too than they've ever been right They're yeah not the, it's hard the, the tests are harder yeah. for sure I think um, getting back to some of the things that Dr. Blaisdell has pointed out into his report here too whether it's um, his attendance or the academics he's mm. mentioned star math we have our uh, he's mentioned yeah. benchmark uh, we talked about panorama a couple of times uh, both tonight and in the past so we're for the first time as a district K to 12 are using a progress monitoring tool for all of our students so we have all of our students in terms of their academics uh, their behavior incidents um, whether it's a, an infraction that deals in discipline or not we can document that social emotional learning issues um, as well as their attendance and, and, and other factors so we're monitoring that uh, and some of these tools that are referenced here give us some predictability because they're aligned to state standards so it really gives us real-time data that we can create opportunities at the building level through the principal but also in grade levels and in team meetings to have conversations about how kids are doing because mm. the best thing for us it, regardless of what we're talking about is really knowing where our kids are at and responding early and often and more often if they're struggling that's great yeah okay anything else 
regarding this presentation. Thank you very much for being here this evening. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Uh, a follow-up on the panorama. Uh, what happens to the data when they graduate? Oh, geez, we haven't gone that far. We, it's archived? <laughs> that data is archived. No, we, um, so right now, um, this is our third year having it in some regard in the, in this, in the school department. So um, that data gets archived for, it's, we, we control it because it's really coming from our own student information system. Yep. So it's just a portal that displays it in a way that's easy for us to navigate and to create plans. So that stays with us. We have that information. In fact, when the students leave South Elementary School, it will go to the middle school middle and school. follows them. Mm -hmm. It will have all, we can mm -hmm. go back. So eventually, as a high school principal, the high school principals could go in, or anyone at that building level could go in and then look at students and how they performed when they entered, first and entered our school. And we can look at attendance. We can look at their attendance. We can look at their behavior. We can look mm -hmm. at their academics and really kind of tell a big picture and use that information to help you know, guide our supports. But we, we, we control that. 1984. <laughs> Sorry? 1984. Big brother. Big brother is watching you. No. <laughs> and now he has it documented. <laughs> <laughs> and he keeps it. <laughs> yeah, Ms. Badger. And it's something that's going to be with this child throughout. So yes. just hearing you, it, it kind of stuck with me. It made me think. So I have a troubled elementary school, and then I get to middle school, and I do better. But... Is my teacher going to see that immediately and expect me to be maybe that troubled child? No, is, so no? Okay. it doesn't go to the teacher. Okay. No, right. uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> the, the teachers only see the students in front of them. Okay. So they're going to see if for, mm. for that particular school year. They're not going to see the that team. we have that at district level and administration has okay. certain points. Mm -hmm. No, we, it's... It's about having that and, and using that to help create interventions and success okay. plans when necessary, but not to mark a student as having mm -hmm. attendance issues necessarily from okay. back when they were in kindergarten and, and track them in high school. Um, but we have that so that we, it's more about um, knowing where they're at <coughs> and trying to be prepared and, and transition yeah. better um, from one year to the next. So it's, we're, no, we're not using okay. it. I figured I just, it just it also a alarm question, bells for no, me. No, it's a very good point. It also allows us, because what our, what our goal with this is not just to monitor progress, monitor and have that data there, but to create success plans. So teachers are meeting in teams with their, about their students, creating plans. So we can now track our intervention plans. So we can say, all right, we've been trying level literacy intervention, for example, in this, with this grade level. How is it working? And we can pull all the kids that are in that and see how they're doing. So it gives Absolutely. us good data about how are our, are these truly best practices? Should we continue with this? So it kind of gives you the macro and the micro. Okay, thank you. Yep, you're welcome. All right, we're gonna take a break. We'll reconvene at eight o'clock. 10 minute break, please. Right. I've had a request. It wasn't me, it wasn't me. <laughs> We're all back, so I'm going to bring us back into session. Thank you very much for coming back promptly. Uh, we'll just have a small update on our on our uh, superintendent's uh, search process, uh, Ms. Fry. Um, yes, um, we have, as you all know, we've put out a number of um, items for the community regarding um, information sessions for the community to come and share with us what they're looking for in the new superintendent of schools. For parents and community members, it's Monday, November 4th from 5 to 6.30 here and Thursday, November 7th from 7 to 8.30. I am meeting with Rich Harbert tomorrow who will get this out in the newspapers and it's also on all of our social media forms. We'll continue to share and we'll also um, do a all call to parents and things like that next week when it gets a little closer. Um, We'll, at that meeting, we'll have guided questions and just asking for feedback and input. We also have five sessions for faculty um, at different locations all over town. We're actually using the PD day um, where all the staff will be on the South Campus. We're having one as voluntary at the end of that as well, which I think will be well attended because everyone is there at that time. Um, and at that point, we will take the data um, and share it. Obviously, the school committee will be involved in that. And in December, we'll be sending an electronic survey out to 
all the school community um, to get that data. And then the job will be posted probably the middle to the end of January. Once we gather that input, redesign any job description needs we have, and put that posting out. So that's really just a, a brief update of where we are now. There, Dr. Mastis' picture is on all the flyers. <laughs> um, and so, but those will be put out in any other forums that anyone thinks is necessary too, so. Okay, any uh, committee members with questions? I would add that I had a couple of town meeting members on Saturday ask me uh, about these forums and about the screening committee, so I just told them what we had. Okay, moving to the next agenda item, which is the uh, annual review of the resolutions for the Massachusetts Associated School Committee Conference that's coming up in November. November, as I have it? Yeah, November, yeah, November yes. November 8th, yes. right. Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, Dr. Maestas. Yes, we have a number of resolutions uh, in preparation for the MASC, MASS uh, conference in, in November down the Cape. And uh, the first resolution is relative to um, the uh, polystyrene foam availability in food service programs. Uh, there are schools around the Commonwealth that still use uh, styrofoam, which Plymouth is one of those school communities that uh, still does use styrofoam. It's been in existence for, for quite some time. Um, I, I believe, you know, my recommendation is that I, I absolutely uh, do support this. One of the things that, that most schools will have to consider that use polystyrene is there's a significant cost increase to using alternatives to polystyrene. So although uh, we do support it, I do support it, I think there's some monetary item that we have to adjust as time goes on because uh, we, we have done an analysis of what it would cost for us to uh, change away from polystyrene and there would be an, an increased cost for school lunch prices for the district, prior raised by about a quarter. So that would be something that we'd have to consider. Keep in mind, that is not only Plymouth, but that's every other community. Um, Plymouth, the Plymouth Public Schools, just so that people understand, is we are a 100% food service program that is supported by the revenue that the food service program generates. Mm -hmm. So <coughs> this is a budgetary item. So when we pass our budget in December, not pass our budget, present it, you'll notice food service, there's zero dollars in there. Keep in mind that in the future, if something were to change, the school committee will have to make a decision as far as budgetary increases or an increase through policy at this point where we do have budget uh, increase or price increase for school lunch. So I think it's a great opportunity. I have um, received letters from students over time regarding this issue. I have, um, you know, 10 years ago talk, talked about this issue, um, but it's a matter of, of, of cost. Mm -hmm. Uh, in my time, we've raised our lunch prices twice, um, and those were, you know, uh, it's harder to raise, raise a lunch price, you know, so um, we're getting to the point now that at the high school would be three dollars a lunch when we try to keep it under three, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's something for debate down the road, but just so you know, that's going to be the impact to every school that has to be involved with making a change like that. It's going to come, it's going to have to come from somewhere. Mm -hmm. And okay, just to clarify to the committee. We will vote on each one of these resolutions tonight, and uh, then the representatives will take our vote to the conference. So now we're discussing resolution number one. Who's our representative? Me. Ms. Hunt. Uh, Ms. Hunt, regarding resolution number one. Okay, so I went to the informational meeting for all these resolutions, and I took some notes. Now, just know that these aren't my opinions. These are just my notes. Yeah. Um, because there was a lot of discussion on all of these. Um, and for this one, some of the things that they brought up as a point is to note the important part about this resolution is the part that it's not going to be effective till 22, 23. And the reason why they don't want to wait till that, they want to tell you now is so that the schools have a chance to prepare. And that um, right now, cafeterias and schools aren't recycling and they don't, cafeterias don't have the option to recycle, um, and that warm foods release the styrene, and that I think within the year, both McDonald's and Dunkin' Donuts are going away with these. So those are the notes that I took on that one. Ms. Badger. 
I, I think this goes perfectly in line with what we were talking about. We've taken our recyclables, um, open new business what, or old business, to kind of transfer it into what are ways that we can use biodegradable materials. And so I think that you know it goes along the lines of what we've been talking about. And I, I know if, if everybody is required to or made to, the prices have to go down. I mean, it's the mm -hmm. supply and man, all that jazz. So hopefully. And that's what they, they did talk the about hope. that as well. Yeah. They said that's the hope. But by then, more more people will be right. doing it, yeah. like McDonald's and Dunkin' Donuts. Yeah, so and the you drive your price down. Mr. Hopefully. Morgan. Uh, are some styrofoam um, recyclable? I know that. But not uh, in every town. <coughs> What's that? But it just doesn't recycle in every town. No. Okay. Yeah. Depends on I think it are. says in here, too. Because I know what's my recyclable. recycle through my vendor at home, we, there are certain styrofoam that have the Let mark on it. Well, my vendor won't even recycle anymore because he said Losing they money. said it doesn't Mr. Selly. cost Mr. money. Well, that's my sentiments from what Michelle had said. I know since I've been, this is my second term elected, we've been having these conversations about recycling. It's come off non old business and new business. It's been something we've had a struggle with. But I mean, we can send a man to the moon, but we can't make a, you know, a cup that's biodegradable. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what's, what do we do in terms of, you know, keeping clean products in the schools and, you know, making mm -hmm. sure we're making the right decisions for it? Because. I mean, it's, it's well, coming through. So. Us is we, we can certainly vote in favor of the resolution, but we have to understand that it probably is going to be an increase in the lunch prices down the road. Ms. Badger. I move that we support this resolution. And we have a second. Ms. Badger has made the motion to support. Ms. Hunt is the second. Are there any questions? All right, and we're going to vote. Excuse me, who was the second? I, I second it. I'm sorry. I was um, sleeping at the wheel. <laughs> it's China time. We just did it for tomorrow. Pretty much. I'm just right. I usually have a loud water bottle. Waiting on two more votes. All right. Now waiting on one more vote. <laughs> And everybody has voted in favor. Thank you. Resolution number two, Dr. Maestas. Yes, this one is relative to um, the MTEL, which is uh, the assessment for teachers. And there is a, um, a resolution that is relative to eliminating the MTEL to increase um, diversity of applicants for uh, teaching positions in the Commonwealth. And you know, I, I am. You know, I'm not in favor of this because I believe if we lower that bar, um, I think there are, in my opinion, there are other ways to increase uh, diversity in our school systems on the teaching end, other than lowering, lowering the assessment for our, our potential teachers. Um, so, you know, th this is a, a difficult one because um, MTEL has been around for, for quite some, some time. A number of ad adjustments have been um, made uh, for MTEL, and I'll give you an example. When I first uh, started teaching, there, there was not an MTEL. You didn't have to take it. it was, you, you, you got your license, you, you proved you did your coursework, and so on. Um, after I got my principal license um, and I don't know what I was thinking. I thought maybe I want to be superintendent one day. <laughs> I, I landed up taking, I had to take the MTEL. So at the time, you had to go to um, Braintree High School. We're probably in the same class. Yeah, yeah. But it was at Braintree High School, and you had to um, listen to a tape recording. Mm -hmm. And you had to transcribe the tape recording. Interesting. Okay? And you listen to it once and for content listen to a second time and you had to transcribe it in correct grammar, the whole thing. And it was probably three or four pages of, of writing. And at the time uh, I took it, that I landed up passing. No, 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 no. But about two years later, they, they eliminated that because there was some issue with um, a diversity of applicants didn't have the ability to um, do that type of transcription mm. because of dialect, because of a uh, different type of uh, background that they had in their uh, education. And I've seen some things change with MTEL over the years. 
I think MTEL is a good indicator of entry level of what we want our teachers to be for reading and writing. And that's what MTEL does. It's for reading and writing. We have content specific MTELs that are for math, science, social studies, special education, mm -hmm. administration, and they are get a little bit more rigorous based on the course content that you're going to get certified in. So you have your basic MTEL, which is the one that I believe this is in reference to. This is not in reference to some of the more specific content, specific if you want to be a physics teacher. Well, you should have that content, right? So again, um, I was able to pass the MTELs. I'm a minority candidate. I, I, I worked very, very hard at studying and doing everything I possibly could to actually prepare myself uh, to become an educator. I believe that our candidates would feel that they want to pass a, a standard two to be in the classroom. So I'm not sure what the context was on why this was proposed. I'm not sure if Ms. Hunt has any information, but no, I, I just don't feel comfortable suggesting that we would eliminate uh, an assessment for entry-level uh, teaching. Ms. Hunt. Okay. Um, <clears throat> some of the things that they had talked about is the, the cost involved, and uh, they also talked about <clears throat> teachers that are close to other states who kind of like just rather just teach in the other states and not choose to teach in, Ma in Massachusetts because of it. There were a lot of stories in the room just like yours, but they they were in the other opinion of, of, of it. What they said is that MTEL is good for test takers, not necessarily educators. And mm. yes, it's for reading and writing, but not teaching. Mm. Um, one of the things that they said is that sometimes the centers are inaccessible in the cities and that um, what they wanted to, what they've been talking about is substituting it with a portfolio, portfolio model and actually having somebody supervise them actually teaching in order to evaluate them as to whether or not they're a good teacher as opposed to just to take this high stakes test. Um, I wrote down accredited college, I have no idea why. Um, and that they wanted the districts to evaluate. And they also said elimination of MTEL and mass performance assessment for leaders. So that's the same thing, right? Yeah, yeah, but, but, okay. but again, if, if that's the case, then, they, then the resolution be, should be very specific mm -hmm. because this is saying to get rid of it. Right. It should be, uh, you know, if there's, if there's a funding issue mm -hmm. with an MTEL, I think that's somewhat easy to resolve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it says in here too, whereas the cost of testing can be a barrier to potential applicants. The, the uh, resolution has a, is, is conflicted to me because it, the second half of the resolution talks about leadership at DESC. And it says that, that, if I read this correctly, it says that if you hold a teacher's license, <coughs> you can't be on the leadership committee at the Department of Secondary and Special Education. Yes. Uh, and so then it goes on to say, let's eliminate the, both those tests, MTEL and MAPAL. Ma That's uh, the PALs. But it yeah. doesn't link them together. It's not clear to me as, mm. yeah. Yeah. It's, it's two different topics in one resolution. It's performance assessment. Right. Not, dis dis it. not described. Ms. Badger. I, I would have to agree as well. When I was reading it, I thought that it was, uh, and I am not a test taker to be 100% like out there. So it's hard for me to say that someone should have to take a test. I mean, I think I would still be in high school if the like if M we tests were a thing. Like <laughs> I, w I got out one year, one year. If I was one year younger, I'd probably still be there. Um, just not a test taker, never have been. And I, you know, like you study very hard and to get there. But um, I agree there needs to be more detail if that is what they're talking about and they want it to be um, uh, pre like a presentation on, or you have to teach in a class and have a portfolio. I think that's great because you're actually doing what you're trying to do. Um, but I think it would need to be amended or something yeah. to really it's fully. Right. And we can, we can propose something as well. well. I think they're two different topics. There's one as a test for teachers and there's a whole reference to to the Massachusetts Associated School, uh, School Committee. I mean, uh, secondary education. There are two there, different there, topics there, in the same resolution. There, there are two d distinct assessments. Mm. There's the MTEL, and, and then there's the Mass PALS. PALS is more of a performance assessment for your uh, administrative credential. 
Yeah. Whether it be an assistant principal, principal, uh, whether it be a superintendent, assistant superintendent, curriculum coordinator, and those are content specific performance assessments that you have to work through. So they're 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 very different assessments. It, it looks like they were they started to write the resolution about MTEL and decided to throw in the other one at the very end. <laughs> yeah. It didn't make so sense to me. Mm. So right. I would be I would recommend we not vote for it. Um, it's unfortunate because I think um, in terms of um, increasing uh, um, the diversity of um, educators, I mean, studies have shown that if you do specifically in areas where um, the students, there are more minority students, if you have people that look like you, there's more propensity for you to go to college. And I know that there are school districts that um, have these students and they don't have that representation in terms of educators. The unfortunate thing is that, you know, now we're um, getting rid of licensure. It's, un it's unfortunate that there's not this universal type of testing. I think about like when I started nursing, you literally had to take a test for each state until they made this universal yeah. type of yeah. testing. Um, there is so there is um, it's, it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate that this is kind of, I hate to say kind of convoluted the re uh, resolution um, and that there needs to, it probably should have been a little bit more thought through. Well, uh, you know, I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's a, a young man who graduated from the Plymouth schools. Um, he went, uh, got certified in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. um, went to New York City, mm -hmm. was offered a teaching contract, started teaching. He was, showed up for work on day one, pulled him out and says, you can't work here because your license does not have reciprocity in New York City. In order for you to get reciprocity, it doesn't exist anymore. Mm. You have to go in and take all these courses. Mm -hmm. So he landed up going in to teach in a private school where he didn't need the license. Mm -hmm. But there are so many layers of for why cer certain candidates cannot get into school systems. And, and I think there is no national assessment. There is no national entry that you can teach from state to state to state and um, very similar to assessments mm -hmm. for students. It, you know, that's why we had this effort to try to have a common assessment, which you saw how far that went. Yes, yeah. But it's just unfortunate because, you know, when we look at some of the, I, I can think of some school districts here in Massachusetts where it, because they don't have um, a, a minority pool here, mm. it, it would be best for them to look out of state. And so now here's the barrier. Yeah. That's what I'm so um, I, I, you know, it's. Um, okay. I think there I think needs to one be thing they um, just so one thing they do offer if you're from out of state that if you have experience in another state you can qualify for a temporary license for a year to give you some wiggle room and time for the actual licensure you're hireable with that qualification um, based on experience outside. So mm -hmm. that is one thing. Well, I can tell you, mental health though, uh, mental health you have to take the state test. Correct. You can't, you can't, yeah. There's no reciprocity because you have to learn right. the state laws. Right. Yes. The only other piece that does come up with some mental health providers is there's a panel review process. Um, the only two I've ever seen approved were in the mental health field. Um, so it's something that they do grant, but it's based on years in the field of service, if that makes sense. So it's interesting. Right. Ms. Hunt. So do we have any kind of direction that if this goes in a certain direction, it would be supported? Or do are there anything like you want to think of to the next meeting to make any you want me to represent any changes or do you just want to flat out say no mm -hmm. that's what we have to decide i, I don't j just to, to be clear i i think the premise is a good premise yeah. no but i meant if we voted no yeah. but i know a lot of times you say no but if it goes in this direction yeah i'm i'm i, I'm, I was i was I'm almost going to get there <laughs> um, but I, I think if there is some level of discussion regarding alternate opportunities for minority candidates to enter the field okay because what th this is saying eliminated the mtel assessment i think we can make it attractive for minority candidates to even want to get into education yes because i don't think that we're getting the candidates in education i think that's that's a big barrier i mean i, I think if we train them well they would pass anything we put in front of them but if there's direction for, you know, how do we increase these programs so that they can be viable and attractive for people to want to 
I mean, even getting into teaching anymore, it, it's, it's not the most desirable profession. I don't want to spend forever on this one resolution, but is there a dearth of applicants that we have to, that we have to make the requirements easier? Um, we, we have st we, when we interview and hire, we look for the certified candidates first. So that's our first level. The fields that are most complex to fill, like high school physics, chemistry, special education, those are the more complex ones. And there is a process to file for a waiver with the state. And we do that based on if there's a need. We don't have to hire the certified candidate if they're not the viable candidate, the most qualified in our estimation of the interview process. So we have done that before, um, but it's really in those areas, other areas where we find certified candidates who are strong. So we have um, made, in my time in Plymouth, we've made efforts to recruit at different fairs that bring a more diverse teaching population. The complex part is to get them to want to come work in Plymouth because of the commute and different things in the city and things like that. So we have, there's a job fair that I go to each year that's more of a diverse um, population of teachers coming in, um, different than say the Bridgewater State College University Fair, but um, it's getting people, to, we really work at it, believe it or not, to try to get a more diverse um, teaching group. So, but the licensure is usually not a barrier um, for us. Okay, we have to take a vote on this, uh, one way or the other. I guess we could take no action, too. What does the committee want to do? Mr. Morgan. <clears throat> um, I'll make a motion to vote no on supporting resolution two. We have a motion. Is there a second? Can you move to vote no, or do you have to move to support uh, it, and then we nope. vote no? Right oh, down. whatever I, I works. Motion, That's whatever how, works. You have to word the motion the right way. Okay. Right, well, there's a motion on the floor, unless you're withdrawing it. I'll withdraw if it'll All make right. it easier. So the floor is open. I think you can make the motion still, but it has to be. I'll make a motion to take vote. a vote yeah. on resolution two. Two. Your motion is to take a vote on resolution two. So you're not... So your motion is not for or against, it's just to take a vote. Yes. <laughs> Unnecessary motion, because it's on the agenda as an right, action Right, I know. Item. I just, no one's stepping forward. I appreciate you. I appreciate what you're trying to do, but it's on here as an action item, so therefore we don't need a motion. Will we, put, is there, will we put additional language to it with an amendment? Yes. Well, that's what Maybe I was asking. The motion yes. We can work to, that out right now. Yeah, let's, So vote to amend. Do you have a suggestion on, the, on additional language? Um, I don't have a suggestion. I, I mean, I can present any um, okay. amendment that does anybody that the board have a suggestion on wishes? additional language, Ms. Haywood? Suggestion or a motion to vote on additional language? <laughs> oh yeah, because we're not in discussion yet. No, technically. What's your question? I think you have to move to support the motion, and then we vote it no. If you want no, isn't that how it works? I mean, am I wrong? No. 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 Uh, if you want to put on the table right now mm -hmm. an amendment to the resolution, not to a motion, but to the resolution, okay. we now can vote on the amendment. resolution with, with the, the amendment. amendment. Oh, with and the then amendment. the new language will be yes. brought to the next meeting in which we vote on, which Kim would then right. amend mm -hmm. at, oh, right. suggest yes, the amendment correct. at. Okay. That's correct. Right. I would agree. Um, so does anybody have some language to, to give oh, us latitude on this? I don't know if I have language at this time. I mean, I would like to think about it. Um, um. Ms. Hunt. Can I make a motion that we, we consider that and bring that to the next meeting and have something written down? Because it's it seems like something we can't come up with right now, right? No. We agree. need to think about it a little bit. I won't be in the next meeting, but you can get this information to me, mm -hmm. and I can vote uh, as to your wishes. Mm -hmm. Okay, we will. So I, can I move I to can, table chair, it to the next meeting? I can table yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. the vote on resolution <clears throat> number two until okay. our next meeting. Yes. Everybody understand? Yes. Yep. Moving forward, mm -hmm. you guys can develop some language, or any one of us can develop yep. some language. Yep. Okay. Let us move to school transportation resolution number three. School Dr. transportation. Masters. This is a. This is a, uh, a hot button topic as we've discussed uh, for a couple of years now relative to bus contracts. Um, in Massachusetts, uh, it's very difficult now to get uh, com uh, competition or competitive bids. There are limited bus companies and, and one of the issues that we see is that Massachusetts general law does not allow um, a school district like Plymouth to maybe partner with a couple of other districts to kind of bring and consolidate our busing. Uh, to be able to have a, a more of an attractive bid so we could package this and have efficiencies. 
Um, and that's one of the things that this resolution is trying to do is trying to open up the door so school districts like Plymouth and others that have contracts where it's really we have limited people bidding on these things to maybe come up with alternative means of having a more cost effective transportation so I support this uh, recommend this resolution and I, I think um, it would be nice to be able to look at other avenues other than the ones that were kind of um, streamlined to, 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 to move forward with yes, hon. All right, um, they just made a point of saying it's not regional schools, it's the Regional Transportation Authority. Right now they're required to take the lowest bid regardless of past performance, and that this would also mean a repeal of Mass General Law. <clears throat> Committee members, discussion on this resolution before we put it. Take any motions. I, I need clarification. I actually went through Mass General's uh, uh, laws trying to find MGL C71 and 7C, because they're recommending we eliminate those two. So I wanted to read the law to see what's in those two, and I can't find it in the book. Does anybody know what it is? Uh, I think the person in the room that could probably answer it the best is to my right. I don't know if he's willing to take the challenge tonight. But, uh, we, we talked about it this morning. You did, and, good. But we did not get into the specifics of Mass General Law language. I didn't pull out my book. Um, if you can find it, Dr. Sorensen, I'd find it. <laughs> I have it with you. You want to read? I can't yeah. find, even find it in here. Yeah. Seven, what's this section? What was the, what was the Ms. section? Badger. What was the section again? MGL 7C. MGL 7, 71 and 7C. So I think I have it. <laughs> Um, and it just says okay. section 7c uh, basically no financial assistance shall be provided it, it, um, for the purchase of buses or operations thereof to any applicant of such assistance unless such applicants and the Secretary of Transportation and Construction shall have first entered into the agreement that such applicants will not engage in school bus operations exclusively for the transportation of students and school personnel in competition with private school bus operators so you can't have your own if you're going to compete with private. This section shall not apply to an application with respect to the operation of a school budget program if the applicant operates a school system in the area to be served and operating, operates a separate and exclusive school bus program for their school system. So you can't compete or be okay, within so the school district. Is about the it's just about who can own. Conflict between uh, uh, a transportation company and an individual school system. Yes. What about the other one? Uh, what about seven one. I, that is it. It goes so it's it's just the title chapter seventy one section seven C. Oh, okay, okay. So All it's right. just a. So you covered it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that clarification. You're welcome. That's why I don't use the book and just Google. Google. <laughs> <laughs> when you're my age, you do books. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I give mine Rolex. back every year. I'm like, eat it. <laughs> All right, so where are we on this one? Ms. Badger. I'm, I move that we support resolution three. Seconded by Mr. Morgan. Any, any more questions? Okay, we'll vote on number th uh, resolution three. All right, uh, I'm by fast. I assume everybody voted for that. I didn't catch it. Uh, resolution number four, climate change. Yes, climate change. This uh, resolution is, uh, represents a call by advocates for action on climate change at the federal level and for state funding to anticipate the climatology implications and the emergencies that, that it may cause. So I'm in agreement with this resolution. My concern is the policies and practices that but it must be relevant despite the climate that may or may not exist now and in the future. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think there's, mm -hmm. there's exactly. a lot of, of uh, concern regarding climate change mm -hmm. and yep. uh, discussion. A lot of discussion uh, nationally. Right. There's a lot of discussion nationally about climate change, and sometimes right. it gets a little political, but mm -hmm. yeah. Ms. Hunt. Okay, so <clears throat> the first thing that was expressed is that it's it's nonpartisan. Um, that was there's a big discussion about that that it's a, a physical and economic um, thing. And I know that with what you had just said, one of the things that they said is basically this 
is just for MASC to go on record as supporting it. It's not saying it has to be funded this way. It has to, they just want to go on record as supporting it as an issue, and that it's a human rights and general justice issue. They are predicting that the cost to the state for schools could be upwards of $200 million to combat schools that don't have ACs in Massachusetts, as well as all the schools that are near the ocean. So they're predict predicting in the long run it could be very, you know, costly to schools if they have to, you know, like you said, we don't know what's going to happen yet. Right. But, you know, that's kind of what it is. So basically what it is is that they want to go on record as supporting it. I mean, then Daniel Morton could be beachfront. Exactly. <laughs> and there's no AC there. You open the windows on one floor, you close them on the other floor. I said it 20 years ago. Uh, motions. Science. Badger. I move that we support resolution number four. Seconded by Mrs. Hayward. Question on the motion? All right, we'll vote. We have one opposed, we have two opposed, and four in favor. One, two, three, four in favor. Motion carries. Okay, a full funding of transportation costs regarding foster care and state care students. Dr. Maestas. Yes, this is um, one of the issues that we talk about every time we go through budget, and it's relative to um, expenses that are um, mandated by the state of Massachusetts for students that have foster education. Um, if we have a student that's in another school district, uh, excuse me, uh, a student that is actually fostered and they uh, our, uh, their foster family is another community outside of Plymouth. Law mandates that for continuity of educational services, we would provide the transportation to actually keep that child in Plymouth. There is some partial uh, reimbursement of that. This resolution is looking at fully funding uh, these opportunities that exist for students to have continuity of education. We've never had a problem with, uh, you know, allowing these students to stay. It's, it's just a matter of doing business. Um, our, our district has a, uh, some expenses regarding this, and I think it would help us if, if this was fully funded. So in a sense, it would be a funded mandate opposed to being a partially funded mandate. So I, I'm in support of this. Committee, mm -hmm. Ms. Hunt. So I'm just going to give you my notes. <clears throat> um, uh, they said it's in support, Suzanne Bump, the state auditor, and that DCF should be pulling these grants now from the federal government. The money is there, always has been, and they're just not reaching for it. Wow. So it kind of sounds like, an, I mean, from what I, everything that they said, it's like it's a no-brainer. That money is there. They're just not asking for it. <clears throat> well, just for clarification on the, on the um, partially funding, this was not funded at all, and then there was uh, an adjustment made for partial funding. Yeah. So I think any leverage that we can, uh, any, any uh, highlight we can put on this would be very helpful. It, it would be wonderful if we got this reimbursement. Yeah. Okay. okay. Motion. Mr. Morgan. I'd like to make a motion to support uh, resolution number five. We have a motion. Is there a second? Call me Mr. Selly is the second. Is there a question on this motion? Okay. Everybody has voted in favor. And now the next one is universal quality of pre-K across Massachusetts. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think one of the things that we, we realized with the funding of full day K here in Plymouth that we were uh, one of a handful of school districts that, that still didn't uh, have full day K at the time. Uh, there are still districts in Massachusetts that do not have uh, full day K. And I believe that, um, you know, I, I would support this. I think that um, pre-K for all would be, uh, or, or the most necessary students that need it would be wonderful and it was funded, it would be great. The only concern I have is where the funding's coming from, and that's my comments relative tonight. Are mm -hmm. it'd be wonderful if, if there was a, a source of funds that would mm -hmm. ensure that this would be um, would not impact the local taxpayers because 
you know, we, we fought really hard for full day K. It took a lot of effort, mm -hmm. and I don't know how it would uh, would go across in the community if we would try to do something else. But uh, again, if there was a funding source, I think this would be mm -hmm. fantastic. Mm -hmm. Facility wise, mm -hmm. facility wise, we don't have a space. Ms. Badger. Oh, I, sure. I, oh, yeah, no. Well, no, first. there wasn't actually, to be honest with you, there wasn't a lot of discussion on this one. Um, the discussion was that it's pre-K mm -hmm. and we still don't have K. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. K is still not mandatory in Massachusetts. Absolutely. So, so we're, you know, but, so but there also was just a lot of discussion on, you know, how important mm -hmm. it is to have the, the, the pre-K part of it. But there really wasn't a whole lot of argument mm -hmm. against it. But it was just kind of a curious thing, like, hmm, they want them to do pre-K, pre but we don't have K yet. It's like the type before the horse type mm -hmm. of thing. I was just going to say that I think this is wonderful, but I, I like Dr. Maestas, feel that it, we <clears> would <throat> need to maybe add, an, maybe we can vote it with an amendment to have it fully funded <laughs> if it's something we're going to be mandated to do. Mm -hmm. It's just my uh, I think you could propose that amendment right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. if we all agree with that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So let's say that... Uh, I, I move that. Move the resolution with the <laughs> amendment that we are only in favor of it if it's fully funded. Yes. Anybody understand that? Any questions? Is there a second? I say, what is the second? Okay. Any other questions? Okay. With the amendment, we shall vote. Are you on this? Are you on this? Well, I was going to ask: Is somebody going to write up what, how, how exactly you want the amendment write it, written? Because I'm going to have to propose it. Because yeah, we have two resolutions with amendments. Oh. Well, we don't yet. The other one's tabled. Oh, yeah. You will have. I, I, I thought yeah. I just dictated. I thought I said we support this yeah. uh, with this uh, uh, just, resolution just as that? long as it is fully funded. Okay. Right? Isn't that what we were saying? Yeah, usually there's yeah. a little bit more in well, we information. Sometimes less words are better. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I, I was just going to say I'm happy to help write them if there's a couple of people who want to work on the resolutions. Well, then you, you folks can do that. I know I am complaining, but I think we, but I think this is really important, not that it's going to go anywhere, because that's what happens with these resolutions. But Sit on your we can dream. Shot. I'm sorry. It's hard for me. Hey. <laughs> I really need to learn. No. All right. All right. If that's all you want to write, that's fine. I'm, I'm happy to do it. All right. Please do. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Poverty. Um, Michelle and Ben Ness. I moved okay. in. She seconded it. Yeah. Okay. So th this, so this one um, is relative to um, poverty in children. The, this resolution would help to ensure that our underserved population of school children will be provided with the supports and services necessary for lasting success in the classroom. And, you know, I, I, I really sub support the premise, and I really support that we would need to support children that um, have needs that are going unmet. Just like the previous resolution, I'm in support of it if there are a, a, a delineation of what is necessary to be funded and if, if there was a means to fund them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I didn't put, I didn't, I, I added a piece with my recommendation that we need to find out exactly what, this is kind of open-ended, I don't know exactly what they're, what they're saying is necessary. Level the playing field for for what? Close the achievement gap, but but what it will help with closing the achievement gap. So it doesn't really delineate exactly what they're referring to. Mm -hmm. Ms. Hunt, and basically it's exactly what you said that the really all that they had really said is that it's going to be a social safety net for kids. That's really all that I. Think. May I ask you a question? It says reaffirmed. So did this come up in 2015? It yes. And was it voted on? I don't. I. Yes, I believe so. It's a re reaffirmation. So I think that they're just bringing it back up again. Framingham School Committee puts through a lot of resolutions. I don't know if it's because of Beverly or not, but. Yeah. Um, Ms. Badger. Oh, I thought. Uh, Ms. Hayward. Nope. nope. Okay. <laughs> Somebody? No. I can look up the actual. I can get that information on the 2015 resolution if you want. Yeah. Can you look it up? Yeah. Well, I'm questioning why you have to re reaffirm something. That's the truth. Mm. <laughs> Has the length changed? Yeah. Unless I know that. It didn't go anywhere. It probably didn't go anywhere. Yet. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I know that. Maybe they just want to bring it back to the surface and, and advocate for it a little bit harder to, and going forward. Bedna. 
Well, um, poverty is now under this, um, you know, childhood traumas, um, you know, uh, umbrella, guess, like umbrella, exactly, and um, and so I, once again, this is another resolution that probably should have been a little bit more thought through mm -hmm. um, in terms of like the language, um, because now we're looking, because that's part of ACES, you know, as well. Mm -hmm. So you know, the the question is now, you know. We know that this affects how a child learns, but there aren't any solutions. No. So, um, yeah, it just needs to be a little bit more thought through. Quantify, cl clarify. Mm -hmm. yeah. These almost look like solutions yeah. he here. But it's generalized. Yeah. I just feel like it's generalized. Yeah. It's not. I, I, that's my dilemma. Michelle, did you find anything? I, I, don't, I don't see anything. I mean, I found the... It might be in the book from back then. That's did what I just it? downloaded I it. I I just downloaded the book. Dean resolutions, let me see. Mm. Poverty in children, here it is right here, but there's nothing, yep, here it is. Did you find it, it's a PDF? Yeah. But it's just a resolution. Uh, poverty and Here children, yep. Um, but you would have to look at the following year, 2016 book, to see what the action was. Do you? I no. think. Mm, mm, yeah, well, I don't know if it would be. The action would be in there. It would well, be in, in this the book, notes. In this book, they have this actions from last year. Oh, they do, okay. Book. Okay, so 2016. Why is my mouse so Same resolution. All right, all right we're going to have to move on. Yeah. 15. I um, almost got it. So. Should we table this one? What's the committee feel about this one? Do you want to do a little research into that as well? I think, I think so. It, it, appears, it appears that in 2015, there was a voice vote taken at MASC, and it was approved. Oh. Mm -hmm. On this, this resolution. So yeah, it's Dr. just Campbell coming to the surface it again. It, okay. it was approved they, they just want to start so. discussing it again, probably. So it's just to it's bring it back on the table him. because the it was not, it didn't go anywhere. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, as, a, as a body of MASC, it was approved mm -hmm. on voice. Bad publicity. Yeah. Okay. Well, now we know the answer to that question, so we can, don't have to worry about that. What do you want to do about it? I guess we voted for it, I'm guessing, in 2015. I don't know. I'm trying to figure that out. I'm sure we went to the same discussion. <laughs> I'm sure we did. Well, I, yeah. Let me search that, too. You want me to look that up? Yeah. No. If you okay. quit, yeah. Do a little search, right? But I was sure. And you have an electronic school bus. Yeah. A schooling doesn't make for messy TV. <laughs> we, we, we may, uh, if I may suggest, maybe we look at the next resolution. Oh, right, there we go. Menstrual supplies. Resolution number eight. Yes, I, I uh, talked to Ms. Hunt about this um, a couple mm. weeks ago when she shared, me with me, uh, shared with me her notes on her meeting, and I was surprised that other school districts don't provide these supplies in the nurse's office, and, and Plymouth mm. does, but I think it, in my opinion, it should be something that we have available for our students. So uh, I do recommend that we should support this. Any uh, discussion on this? Well, Ms. Hunt, you want to tell us something about Um Well, I think the... I don't want to use the word the coolest thing about this. This is a student resolution. Mm. So this came from the students. Um, and you're right. It isn't, it isn't an issue for us, but it, I guess it is across the board. And there are kids in some schools that are literally not going to school <laughs> because they know that this isn't, is going to be a problem for them if they're in the school day. They're literally not going to school for it. Yeah. Um, so it's student-led, it's not a luxury, it's a necessary, it's necessary hygiene, and they're looking for free access to either the nurse, the restrooms, or the locker rooms, or all of that. So that's just, okay. and I, I, I particularly liked the fact that it came from the students themselves, so. Ms. Hayward. So oddly enough, as I was driving to work this weekend, um, I w was listening to a podcast, and it was student-led, it was, um, 13 to 14 year old girls who talked specifically about this. Wow. They came out of the Bronx um, and it was a it was actually an award winning podcast. Um, and it was 
called Shh, period. <laughs> and they talked about it, the supplies and the fact that, you know, um, accessibility. Mm -hmm. So um, it's interesting that they came yeah. up there. So, yeah. yeah. It, well, I heard that same podcast. Yeah, I think I actually listened to that too. And the winner of the short documentary film was about the same subject, yeah. but in India. Yes. Yes. And it was crazy yeah. because was these great. women drop out of school because they don't have this so not that we're there but no. i guess i guess for us you know we just should consider ourselves once again ahead of the game but there are okay there are schools. Call for motion, Ms. <clears throat> i just say one thing and then a motion i know when cambridge public schools went through this same thing and it was a big deal in cambridge they didn't have it and my friends on the school committee and she pushed for it and which is weird you would think cambridge would have had it but Anyways, I, um, I, I move that we support resolution number eight. Second. Ms. Hayward, great. Questions? Okay, let us vote. Everybody voted in favor. Yes? Uh, Dr. Dr. Swanson, on October 19th, 2015, the there was a unanimous vote to approve the poverty and children <coughs> resolution. Thank you. I figured it was much that we voted once in yeah, favor of it. School board, yeah. So shall we, we yes, shall we is. reaffirm our vote? Might as well, I guess. Okay. <coughs> Board's open for motions. Thank you, Ms. Grimes. <laughs> Badger. I move that we support resolution number eight, uh, seven. Again. <laughs> Again, yeah. Is there a second? second? Mr. Selly is the second. On a question? Okay. And everybody, uh, we have one opposed. Everybody else voted in I'm favor. Not for property with children, by the no, way. No, I know what you mean. Yeah, no, I got you. <laughs> and uh, now we have the charter school funding reform resolution. Dr. Maestas. Charter school funding reform, you know, I, I've, I've said publicly that I am not against charter schools. I'm against certain funding mechanisms that, um, in, that pose some level of inequity, inequities in, in education today. Uh, I'm in support of this resolution and the rationale stated, and um, I'm just, I just think that there are some inequities that, that um, can be looked at and maybe this resolution can help to do that. Ms. Hunt. I feel like we did this last year, the year before too, We've because before. I, I know, I know that I've mentioned that I actually wrote the position statement for Massachusetts PTA on this and it said the same thing. And I, I agree with you about the charter school. So um, as long as they can enroll cross sections of students, report accurate, report accurate numbers of students, report accurate date of students with learning disabilities, accurate data of students with learning disabilities, funded in full by the Commonwealth, and full funding mitigation funds created by the offset. Um, so that's, I mean, I think, I think we've already done this before again, so. I think we did it in 2015. Yeah. Yeah, but I think that. <laughs> the last, no, it was within the last two years. No, I, I believe it keeps coming up because it, it never happens. Never happens. not happening, so. right. And, and, and it should keep coming up until it does happen. Ms. Hunt. And again, too, like, um, you know, all these resolutions doesn't mean it's going to happen. It just means it's going to be a position that we right. take and we try to fight for it. Right. And I don't, I don't know if you could. They just appointed me the legislative chair for MASC, so whatever we decide, it's going to be my responsibility to take the committee and, and fight for this stuff. So mm -hmm. um, it's just, you know, it's not, none of this is set. It's just something that they want to have as a position statement when they're dealing with legislators. So let me get a clarification on, on the mitigation fund. So uh, migration, when the student leaves the charter school and goes back to the public school, the money doesn't follow the child? It should, but it doesn't? October 1 is the... It's all based... We do an October 1 report where we report our student population to the state, and if it happens October 2nd, the money is with the charter school. Uh, and that's, that, that seems to be a, um, a, uh, a date that um, traditional public schools have a hard time with because it's 
Mm -hmm. Students seem to come back after that date. Mm -hmm. Can you like mm -hmm. generate one? There's no, there's no proportion. This resolution is going to fully fund that. I believe that's what it says. It's asking for money to follow. Funded, funded in full in by the Commonwealth. Right. The, pro the appropriation, the mitigation fund is subject to appropriation and has not been fully funded in years. So this would fund that mitigation. So as people often say, the money should follow the student. Right. <coughs> should follow the student for the amount of days in attendance. Yes. This is true. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. Mr. Morgan. I'd like to make a motion to support resolution number nine. <clears throat> Seconded by Mr. Selly. Is there a question? Okay, we'll vote on it. <coughs> Great, everybody vote in favor. Just to recap, we have, which ones we have coming back to us at the next meeting? Just one. And just one so far. Just one? Because we got back to the second one we voted on. Number two. Just number two? Okay. Number two. And if somebody Great. just gets me that, because I won't be here at the fourth. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Thank you. That was helpful. Hopefully it helps uh, Ms. Hunt. So. Yeah. No, yes, absolutely. I'll do whatever you guys. Anybody want to bring up anything under old business? Ms. Ms. Uh, uh, Badger. So I'm just wondering about the, I know we talked about it and that it will eventually get done, but when do we think we're going to be posting the health curriculum to our website for all levels? Dr. Just, Campbell. Uh, sorry, I was reading something else. Uh, I can't get you a, a definitive date. We're still, we have some health, we ha with our PD coming up in November, and uh, what is that, November 5th? Uh, we're still doing some collaborative work, um, but I would see some time after that. Okay. We're building a website behind the scenes, but it needs to be populated. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else under old business? Anything under new business? I don't think so. Okay. Reports and proposals from the superintendent. Dr. Maestas. Yes, tonight I have um, four things to report. Um, we had the opportunity uh, this morning to meet with the NEAS group, and I, uh, I know yesterday the, some school committee members met with the uh, with the NIAS group and opening for the whole visit, and it should be uh, should be a, a good experience for the for the team, um, the the uh, co-chairs that have planned this have done a fantastic job of preparing the school and, and the school community for for the visit. So we were there this morning and just a, a lively place um, for the next two days. We'll be done on Wednesday afternoon. I can tell you, the staff and administration at North will be doing. Uh, laps with joy when they're done <laughs> but a great process and I think I was asked a question today about what I thought the process could do for the school and I said the process will help this school set a blueprint for what is necessary for improvement for the future and if there are when there are things that need to be uh, tweaked and adjusted and refined and integrated the school will do that mm -hmm. and I think we look forward to their report so the school can get busy on that. And I think the principal is, is positioned to do that and has the support of the staff to actually make some of the improvements that will be recommended. So we're excited to see how the process goes and we'll be excited to see the report when it's complete. Um, uh, I'd like to highlight last week, uh, we did have a, a couple of issues with weather and we also had an issue with um, uh, a police uh, situation here in Plymouth relative to a stay in place uh, and I just want our community to know that I was out of the district during both of those events and I'm very proud of our administrative team that was able to uh, navigate uh, the difficulty uh, that we experienced in two days which was uh, I think it's a testament to um, the protocols and processes that we built in this district over the years so I thought it was handled extremely well and one thing that I'd like to highlight in addition is for our parents out there listening tonight and community members the information that is sent out of our school district is firsthand it is not anything other than what is happening 
actual actual time, real time, that's ha happening in the community. So I would hope that parents, stakeholders of the community, if they want to learn about a situation that's happening in town and they want, relative to schools, please listen to the messages that we sent home, uh, Facebook, um, Twitter, Instagram, and also our app that we have, that new app that people are downloading, please rely on those messages. That is going to be your first hand information. What we seem to be noticing during issues like we had last week, people tend to rely on um, gossip and internet chatter more than they are actual messages that are coming out from, we, we got our stuff, information firsthand right from the Plymouth Police Department. So if you want to find it quick, we're, I, I believe we're very quick in responding and getting things out. And we're not going to send something out that's not um, accurate, and we will send it out when it is accurate. So it may not be 30 seconds after. It might be 3 minutes or 10 minutes or 20 minutes after, but it will be accurate. And we hope that people will rely on that information and learn to trust the information that we sent out is, is accurate. So, um, but again, very, very proud of, of, of uh, difficult circumstances that we were able to navigate. Uh, advisory dinner, we were at that uh, the other night, and I, I tell you, it was a great evening. Uh, food was great, and, and the presentations, both of them, a, a current student and a graduate, uh, did a fantastic job of presenting in front of the advisory team that actually advisories the vocational um, CBTE programs in what is out in the field, and the, these two presenters uh, um, did a fantastic job. Um, a current student who, I'm not sure if you know this, but the Massachusetts um, DECA president, student president for the entire state of Massachusetts is a student, Maria Baker, at Plymouth South High School, and we should be very proud of her. She did a fantastic um, presentation, mm -hmm. and it's yes, wonderful it's to, to see these kids get up and publicly speak, and, you know, uh, did a fantastic job. I'm very proud of that. And I just want to let the school committee know that about two, three weeks ago, I uh, turned over the gift from Shishikahama that Mr. Morgan brought back. And the um, Board of Selectmen will actually um, uh, reveal that gift to the community on October 29th at their school, at their Board of Selectmen meeting. So I will attend, um, but just to let you know that that will be revealed to the community on the 29th. So Mr. Morgan, uh, thank you for uh, bringing it back. and in one piece <laughs> well they shipped it so okay uh, well i'll, I'll yeah, be there on the 29th yeah. as well right you know um it was shipped to my house right yes yeah. that's right. <laughs> okay. there was no way it was going to fit anyone's luggage but you saw it beforehand oh yes okay that's 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 right mm -hmm. i accepted a gift i think i don't know what was in that box that i didn't open it report? that's it that's any it. questions to dr maestas on his report Alrighty. now we're going to talk to your SMART goals. Yes, I have uh, four goals uh, this evening. And um, the first goal that I am uh, proposing for this year is I think all of you uh, realize that our strategic plan is, the current one is known as the 2020 plan. And, um, you know, when I first started as superintendent 12 years ago, uh, we didn't have a strategic plan. I think one of the things that I, th I thought it was important for us to do was to develop one and to get it in place so that we had a guiding document that would kind of lead us to the future. And I think the current framework has really helped us to accomplish a great deal in the school, in the school district. Um, I am proposing that we refresh that plan for the future, which will then become the 2025 uh, plan. Uh, I think this will actually help the next uh, administration to guide um, the schools moving forward for the next five years. And I think it's timely in the sense that a new superintendent will come in and they will have the ability to take a look at this and that'll be the, the guiding document that will help uh, to focus some of these issues. I really wanted a strategic plan back in the day because of my personality, not necessarily because we couldn't um, do things, but because I, I want to focus and I, I'm, I'm hard to focus sometimes and I thought the strategic plan would help with that. And I think it has over time. So uh, this goal uh, for this year is to convene a, a, 
a team of people, uh, different stakeholders in the, in the community to actually gather information that will help us to, to refresh this plan for the future. Um, I think a lot of the information that um, Mrs. Fry was talking about earlier uh, in this listening session that we're doing throughout the district as we look forward to the next superintendent will actually help, some of this will help to inform um, what we're looking for as because what people want are they want things to happen. They want the school committee and, and, and the, the superintendent to actually motivate these changes. So I think that listening that we do throughout uh, that process will help. We will also send out some other communications to stakeholders to, to, to seek more input from them as to what's important and have the opportunity to have some forums to bring people together and talk about what is important to the school district. We'll definitely review the information that um, will be brought forward from the school committee uh, to, to the school committee for the superintendent search, but I think there's, there's some nuggets in there that we can pull forward uh, and look at the themes and actually create some action items for, for the future. So, um, you know, I think uh, the action, uh, the as measured by for this particular goal would be the identification of the, uh, of the update committee that we would assemble, uh, survey data that we'll, that we'll collect, um, and also the data that we collect from, from forums that we'll have across the district and the biggest determining factor is by May, the latest June of next year, that we would have a new strategic plan that would be the 2020 to 2025 plan. Um, and I think it would be um, wonderful to actually have a document in place and actually a refresh uh, for our school community as the next school year starts. So we'll be, we'll be ready for it for, for uh, 2020. Um, Kind of, you know, when we were developing the, this 2020 plan, and I, I didn't know that we'd be here talking about the 2025 plan, but here we are. So that is my my first goal uh, moving forward. Um, I'll move to, to goal two. Uh, any discussion on, on that? Thoughts, comments to that? Okay. Uh, the second one is relative to um, Panorama. And one of the things that I would like to do for the school committee um, in the next month or two is uh, have a demonstration for you with uh, data that is um, not Plymouth data, just a, a, a kind of a hypothetical student, that you could actually see what we talk, when we sit here at the table and talk about student information and what it means to look at a profile of a child from a social emotional standpoint, what does it mean? We talk about dashboard, we talk about looking at making really good uh, decisions and helping students. Well, what are we looking at? So I, what, uh, you know, Dr. Campbell and I uh, years ago actually saw a panorama being demonstrated at a, at a meeting. Joint, it was a joint conference. It was a, it was it was a was joint, MAS. It was a MAS, CMAS, yeah. joint conference, probably five or six years ago. <laughs> and they were in their infancy, this, this organization. And we always said, you know what, that'd be awesome. It'd be awesome if we could do this. And as the years went on, um, it's probably two years ago when we started with uh, prevention. Panorama actually, um, we brought them to the table because they could run the prevention survey for us electronically and they could actually tabulate the information and put it on their website so that we could actually start working with kids in a very short period of time. So that's when we engaged Panorama in the social emotional module that they have. So. Panorama has uh, these surveys that they can offer kids that are surveys that we can adjust and tweak along with the surveys that we have already offered kids and we can couple that with student information like we talked about before and um, you know student attendance, uh, 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 trends for discipline, grades so that we can start making really good decisions based on the complexity of data but take away the complexity of reviewing it. So this is a significant goal for the school district because we started doing this with just eighth grade. We then branched off to high school. Now we're going down to the elementary. So this is the work that you'll see this year that will be a culmination of two years of work, but this will be the first time that we will have a collective view from elementary to high school so that by the time a student graduates, we will have collective information. So we can start looking at trends and uh, profiles and students that are really looking at 
um, a lot of different pieces of information that we used to have to go into four or five, six different programs to actually try to make sense of it. Mm -hmm. Now we can see it in a dashboard. And I'm really excited for the school committee to have the opportunity to see what we see. And I think it'll motivate you and excite you as well <coughs> to start looking at students through a data lens that um, can help us set and design um, programming for students. Uh, might be individual with students, it might be groups, it might be uh, school related. So with that said, uh, the as measured by for this would be the successful deployment of Panorama district wide and I think the second piece of this is the professional development is what is going to help us to really make this effective because we, what we want to do with this particular uh, package is make it so that it's just not administrators looking at data. It's practitioners, teachers that see children every day, they can see the data, which is something that uh, our professional development model that Dr. Campbell has put together is really helping this year get our, our counselors, our teachers, and special education uh, departments across the district to be able to uh, look at this data real time. And what I like about this data is it, it migrates from our Aspen program into Panorama synchronously. So when there's an, an adjustment made to a student profile, it automatically goes into the program and it doesn't, it's done behind the scenes. And I think uh, this program um, will be a, a game changer for looking at uh, student profiles and helping with issues that we see throughout the district. So um, the other thing is really, um, we want to see consistent use across the district. So in May, I hope to report to you that we have a deployment across the district where we have from classroom teachers to uh, specialized uh, support staff, uh, school adjustment counselors, counselors, uh, administrators are all in this program understanding students at a, at a, at a greater level. So that's the, 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 the meat of this, of this Questions this or comments on this? Ms. Badger. I just, my question is the word consistent use. I think maybe we need a little definition of what you think consistent is or what you're aiming for. That was the one thing, whether it's a certain percentage or once a week or what we're looking to get our staff to do. I just well, think that I, would I don't be know that it, uh, what I mean by consistent is that it's done in a consistent fashion across the district and across okay. the buildings, not that it, for example, if we have a, every, every um, school in the district has a child study team. Yes. Where they take a look at, um, like a child would get recommended because there's uh, something that they recognized isn't uh, going as well as the teacher would like to see. A child would get referred, child study team would take a look at this data on the dashboard and actually look at what does, it, what does the data tell us about this child and what can we do collectively in our team to make recommendations. What I mean by consistent is that practice of looking at student data is consistent across the district. Okay. So it's a discipline. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm going to throw another another concept at you as you think about this, and and I'm operating from a point of feeling fairly ignorant at this point about power, power, uh, power, what is the word again? Panorama. Yeah, panorama. Uh, everybody knows that we collect data on students' grades, mm. that we hold on data on students' attendance, and and behavior. So now we're going to create an a, 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 a electronic database that's going to track a student's grades, attendance, behavior, social, emotional needs. I think parents who are, some parents who are uninformed might be concerned about the fact that we're taking notes on their child's behavior and maintaining those notes, even though, even though we do it now anyway. Yeah. So I think a piece of this is education to the parents to not be paranoid about this. But this is, uh, this is information that we'll use to, for the betterment of your child, not, not to build a case against your child. Because I think there'll right. be people out there who will respond like that. Yeah. And I've thought about that, Dr. Sorensen, from the beginning when we were looking at this, that this is a, um, a method that parents are unfamiliar with. Mm -hmm. Because the information, for, I'll give you an example. We, we've used uh, a variety of different programs to do the same thing. But it's their independent singletons. This is one program that allows us to do it all in one shot. So it's allowing us to be more efficient, more effective, and to be able to look at how they all work together. So I think to your point, um, maybe correspondence to parents would go out that would indicate that as we have looked at children, the, the data of children in the years past, 
Yeah. We've done this through independent means. We are now using a tool that does it collectively uh, and to make educational There's decisions. Nothing different. And, the yes. and the purpose behind it, like but you said. Right. Yeah. Ms. Hayward. Um, in terms of, I, I think it's, uh, I think it would be wonderful um, to see like a, like a case study yeah. of, a, um, of a student. Um, I think Kim and I had a glimpse of it yeah. at the last um, MAS um, C meeting, but just to see truly what we use here um, in the district would be great. And I think I how we would, in a real situation, intervene, how a counselor team would come together and say, okay, this is little Gary, this is where he's at today. <laughs> And we could actually look at how we use it. And I think yes. parents would be actually pleased at yes. we're looking at their child with this kind of lens. Yes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. You can play a little Gary. Moving on to the We can put my data up. <laughs> <laughs> I could confuse you even more than you are already. <laughs> All right. The, the next goal is um, You know, this is something that I have been wanting to do for quite some time, and I was motivated by a parent visit this summer because of a situation that happened in town relative to their adoptive uh, child. And I was, um, I sat with this parent for about an hour and a half, and the only thing that I could think about doing was uh, raising the awareness of the different um, complexities that we deal with in our community around diversity. And for this particular goal, I would like to create a committee that is relative, very, very connected to our safety committee that meets on a cycle basis. And we set an agenda and we discuss issues around the district that uh, have a variety of stakeholders that we can set goals and set um, opportunities to be able to inform our community, our stakeholders, of what is important to this educational community around diversity. I think it's important that we would work with, um, with No Place for Hate and uh, bring that group into the fold. Um, but I think it's um, something that I've, I've wanted, wanted to do. I, I think this summer, um, hearing from this particular parent on uh, the complexity of what she's dealt with um, in our community. I think um, I was motivated to actually create this as a, uh, a goal for me for the year. So what I'd like to do is, um, is uh, you know, recruit some uh, parents and, and stakeholders, <coughs> staff members, school committee members that are uh, interested in actually being part of this diversity committee. Um, I, I want to schedule uh, monthly meetings that we would have an agenda and members would actually submit items for uh, this committee and uh, hope to have several meetings in the queue by the time this is presented to the school committee in, uh, in, in May um, and also uh, you know, develop some goals that we would work on as a committee. And I would feel comfortable that the superintendent would actually sit on this committee, but I don't know that I would want to run it. I think we would leave it up to the committee to decide how that mm -hmm. structure would operate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with, with safety, the safety committee, I, the chief and I started that years ago, and I, I, I kind of by default run the meetings, but I, I think it would be nice to actually have um, a chair and, and, and have somebody actually um, help to, to motivate that, that, that discussion at the table. So with that said, Dr. Sorensen, this is, that's goal three. For questions, me. comments on goal three. Um, I I think this is wonderful. Mm -hmm. I think we're living in a time where now where um, diversity is so complex. Um, it's not what we possibly um, viewed it as years before. Mm -hmm. um, I and um, just to place, I guess, safeguards in terms of. Um, our student population to know that you know this is an inclusive environment um, I think this is great that we do uh, just a follow-up to that I think I would feel as a superintendent that I would have another resource that if something came up in our district mm -hmm. like I'll, I'll use safety again mm -hmm. when something comes up with safety we have a debrief right yes. yep. we have an opportunity to come to a committee and we could sit back and we could say okay what can we do 
how do we mobilize, what, what, are, what are the challenges that we have, and how can we as a community be able to do that? And I think the lens is specific to this topic, and it's, it's, it's not here anymore. It's, it's, broad it's, it's yes. really broad, and I, I think it would help us in the future to be able to have an opportunity to be able to, to maneuver and strategize and, and, and be proactive on some of the issues that we are faced with today. Yeah, and I think also too, it strengthens it strengthens us as a district. These are things that, P, um, in terms of how we're even uh, graded as a district, this is one of those grading tools, um, and it's a place of improvement. So I think it's awesome that Ms. Mm -hmm. this is brought. I was just going to say, I think this is a great opportunity to include students. I, I mean, getting their thoughts and their ideas on something like this and what they see on the, you know, in the, the ground, um, if you will. And then also, no place for it would definitely love to be a part of this. So, Ms. Hunt. Well, I was just saying, too, you know, just echoing what they had said that. I think too as a as a teaching tool too for the community to realize that mm -hmm. diversity doesn't mean what we think it means it could mean grandparents raising children it, it's yep. not what automatically pops in our head mm -hmm. and I think that you know I think we need to let the community know that when we talk about diversity it's not just certain yeah. things it's it's inclusive of everything mm -hmm. and, and I think that right. you know even yeah. even starting out that way having the committee have some kind of a I don't think you can define it, but you know, de a definition of what what we are talking about or what we're including. Well, I, so I, many layers. I, I think yeah, exactly. That's yeah. what I mean. It's, but it, I mean, I, I think that's important just to let the community know that when we're talking about diversity, there's so much out there that's. It, it, it is it is a bold undertaking. Mm -hmm. But in, I, in, I, my, in my in my practice, we have a handful of uh, genuinely transgender children, mm -hmm. and they struggled beyond mm -hmm. anything you could imagine in this room. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are genuinely transgender. This is, they're not doing this for attention. Uh, so this is a bold undertaking, and I hope, I hope it's successful because we need it. And I follow Ms. Haywood's comments. It's very different than it was when we were talking about uh, civil rights back in the, the 1970s and 80s. Very different now. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the goal is to, to put it on the radar. And I think it's going to be up to the committee to, to march it forward, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and and represent the complexities of society that we deal with today, you know. And um, I think it would be helpful to the, uh, the administration in the district uh, when issues come up, mm -hmm. uh, and have a sounding board to bring some of these issues up. And I know No Place for Hate at times are presented with community situations mm -hmm. that, that we are, are involved in and that we, I mean, this is a great place to bring it yeah. back, yeah. right? And even even to have some level of betting of of what what those those strategies will be. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. All right. That's excellent. One more. Cool. The next one is uh, relative to the 400th anniversary of Plymouth. I think you all you're all aware that we have uh, numerous um, commitments in the district relative to the 400th. We have our first uh, group leaving next month to uh, England. Uh, but there are many, many commemorative activities that um, I, I am representing the school district in, I'm part of, I've been planning. Um, so, you know, I think, um, you know, come July, we will have, uh, I think we'll all be very tired. <laughs> but, you know, I think there's a, a lot going on between now and July and, and even into, into November of next year. But I, I just, I, I just, thought this was important to put this on the radar to to make sure that this is done in, in, a, in a timely fashion and it's done well and I, I, th I think you know that my commitment to this community is is um, is you know I, I love Plymouth and I, I put a lot into it and I think to be representing this community through the 400 um, is important and um, it's a lot of work uh, but I think I want to make sure that everything that we're involved in is done well, and the school children that are part of all of these activities are, are, are prepared, and, and I think um, we're excited to see how, how it all comes together. But this is, um, you know, the, as measured by is really, you know, how, we, how everything comes together by, by June, July, and all the commitments we have. 
Okay, any questions on the last one from anybody? Four excellent goals. Yes. Excellent. Well, these are my, my uh, don't say it. Fun these are uh, the, the 2020 goals for this <laughs> current superintendent. All right, good. All right. <laughs> Moving along. Uh, next thing on the agenda is the fundraising uh, activities. These have we to have. be, it's an action item, Dr. Yeah. Sorensen. Did I miss something? Yeah. It's an action item. Oh, we have to vote oh, on Oh, that's right. Thank you very much. It is an action item. So have you heard the SMART goals? Is there a motion? Ms. Hunt. I, <clears throat> sorry, I um, move that we approve the SMART goals for the 2019-2020 school year as presented. And that's been seconded by Ms. Badger. Is there a question relative to that motion? Okay, seeing no hands, we shall vote on it. Thank you for getting to use my mouse. It's much easier. Mine's being weird. It's much mouse. easier to use the mouse. And everybody has voted in favor. Thank you, everybody. And now, uh, fundraisers. You, we had the information in our package. Any committee members with questions? I just have one and it's minor. I did see that PTA uh, Middle School uh, did a GoFundMe fundraiser. So what is that? I know what GoFundMe is, but what do they just say, donate money? How does that work? Does it say what it's going Does it not list what the, what the cause was for? I'm sorry. Oh, you don't have to. You can find it real quick. I was just curious because I never saw that before. Using GoFundMe for oh, a yeah, fundraising? For a fundraising. We have had crowdsourcing um, that has been used for really for, for how that. does it work? Um, they just set up an account and people just so you set up an account and we've gone through this. Um, Gary Costa and I have gone through this in terms of finding the most appropriate uh, crowdfunding uh, venue to approve, and this is the one that we go with. Um, um, essentially, they set up an account and okay. the funds go specifically for. Um, that particular Whatever activity, that but we, we, we vet what the activity is that they're asking for. All right, Ms. Hunt. I don't know if they use this, but I know GoFundMe actually has a school version of their program that's more towards fundraising versus than anybody, any personal person raising money for something. I yes. do believe there's an school actual version school of version right. of so it. That, right, and there's very right. clear so guidelines in terms more, of how much um, money. Yes. Yeah. Okay, yep. thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the check. Uh, let's do reports and proposals from committee members. Ms. Badger. Uh, so we had, I don't, I'm not there, there's my notes, okay. Um, so we had a, our latest meeting, in the, or our first of the year of the Pilgrim Area Collaborative. Um, this year we are pleased to um, let everybody know that our audit, we passed with flying colors. And a big part of the meeting was discussing that last year, even though we started the year with a, uh, I think we were a $500,000 deficit, we were a little nervous. Um, but we ended up coming out on top and that each district is going to get a certain amount of money back. We're getting a little over $11,000 back. So um, we're excited about that. Um, we, let's see, um, I think that's the basic highlight. And then we did our reorganization and somehow I am now the chair of the Pilgrim Area Collaborative, which is wonderful. I'm very excited about it. It's a great group of people. And so um, if anybody wants any additional information from what we talked about, I have everything right here. So. All right, well, congratulations. Thank you, yeah. mm -hmm. thank you. <laughs> Anything else under reports and proposals? I went to the PYDC meeting um, uh, last week, I believe, yes. um, or two weeks ago. And so, huh? Two weeks ago. <laughs> Days go to each other. Um, and so, um, just uh, quickly, I think they talked, uh, well, what we spoke about was the, um, the moratorium on vaping, um, just um, in terms of like the follow up, just with um, kids who are. Um, going through like the cessation, you know, um, what, what's the symptomology like behind that? Um, they talked about um, uh, the interface, um, uh, there was an interface update on um, the behavioral health grant uh, and um, different um, uh, people from the community who will help kind of advance that information. Um, there was a, um, a a video um, regarding um, 
just information on the opioid. Um, more so, I think it was an, it was um, on a person who um, had received services, and it was an interesting video. I think um, towards the end, uh, a lot of information, <laughs> but um, in the interest of time, there is uh, obviously a update in our notes. I, I can report to you that I put up in my waiting rooms uh, three of the posters that you all brought to this table, Margie brought it. Okay. And I go out to that waiting room and I watch the teenagers read the one on vaping oh, and the one on the teenage marijuana and the brain. Yeah. I think it's yeah. very interesting that get that they stand up because they're on the bulletin board and they read them. So yeah. Glad to hear that. I, I just hope that, you know, um, just because the um, this is just so new in terms of like the the cessation part maybe there's a way that we could possibly support kids who decide to kind of um, break from the habit um, it's it's interesting because it's different from smoking because of the levels of nicotine that are found in vaping right. so um, and even those programs in themselves are kind of um, uh, just um, uh, a breaking ground, so maybe there's a way that we can kind of look to how we can support students yeah. if they decide to, um, you know, stop. You know, what can we do? Because even with the patches and the gum, it's that availability is for people over the age of 18. So, right. what are we doing? You know, yeah. uh, m many years ago, when I was a school psychologist, we ran a uh, alcohol anonymous uh, meeting right in the school. Mm. Uh, kids got to pass out of class and come so. down to the meeting. Mm. And so if we could build in some sort of social support, yeah. a club where kids would have to, you know, announce that they're, I guess they'd have to announce they were doing it first before yeah. they could announce they're not doing it, and that might be a problem. But it's always better to reinforce the behavior you want than to punish the behavior you don't want. Yeah. So anyway, just a thought. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. Uh, building committee. Um, yes, the building committee did meet last Thursday, but due to the um, volume of claims with the storm in my profession, I, I had to work late, so I unfortunately mm -hmm. didn't miss it. And Mrs. Burgess um, couldn't attend because right. of medical okay, issues. Okay, no report this evening. Thank you. Homeschool plans, Dr. Maestas. Yes, we have one homeschool plan that has been reviewed by Dr. Halpin's office, and it does meet the requirements necessary for the school committee approval. So I recommend approval. You've heard the motion? Mr. Morgan. Uh, I make a motion to approve the recommendation of administration. Thank you. Seconded by Ms. Hunt. Any questions on this homeschool plan? All right. We can vote for it. Everybody voted in favor. Accounts? Just waiting for it to scroll. There we go. <clears throat> okay. I move that this Plymouth School Committee accept and approve the report and accounts payable warrant number S102419, dated October 24th, 2019, <coughs> in the amount of $2,415,060.01 as presented. The second it is made by? Ms. Badger is the second on that one. Is there a question on the warrant? Okay. Time to vote. And everybody voted in favor. And we have one set of minutes in our package this evening. It's September the 7th. Well, that's the pleasure of the committee. Ms. Hunt. I move that we accept and approve the minutes as presented. Seconded by Ms. Badger. Is there a question? Seeing no hands, we can vote on the minutes. We have all voting in favor. Thank you. Is there any other business to come before the committee this evening? Okay, we stand adjourned. Thank you very much, everybody.